So this is kind well, of the normally training. I would not shoot animals, but this is just pretend. But I don't want to encourage any yeah. people from killing animals. Yeah. Humans are okay. How, how long does it take from the idea in Josh and you and your partner's brains to get to a completed video game? Uh, well, actually, our dev cycles are shorter than a lot of developers' schedules. So I'd say we usually spend between 10 and 12 months for the games. So generally, you pitch a game to the publisher, and then they'll green light the game. And then at that point, you start the concept and prototype phase. And then that usually lasts for uh, several months for us. And then we basically spend six months or so actually building the rest of the game. And then you have a period at the end, which is about two to three months, where you actually need to get the game ready to submit to the publisher. So all in all, our games generally shake out to be about nine to 12. Um, but some of us have worked on games that have been you know, shorter than that. Some of us have worked on games that have been three years long. This, oh, this is uh, the other video game. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the fourth uh, original IP for the company. What does this IP is, uh, mean? Intellectual property. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, so the, it went the Maw, then Splosion Man, then Comic Jumper. Now Ms. Splosion Man is number four, and Gunstringer, which you're helping us this out is with, a, is number this, five. This is Splosion Man. You know, me and one of the other guys will get a bunch of merchandise and some copies of the game right before it comes out, and we'll fly out to L.A. and San Francisco for like a week and just visit all the different game review companies and show them the game and give them some merchandise and mm -hmm. see what they think and just as an indie company you always have to and I think a lot of people probably especially in games I don't know if it's the same with movies but everyone just wants to make their game and they think their idea is so good everyone will love it but it's only half of it the other half of it is constantly reminding people that you even exist so um, that's you know a lot of people forget about that part and that's why they fail do you get the revenue directly or does is it like in the, the mainstream movie making where the uh, Paramount gets the money and then somebody else in but there's lots of layers of people who get money yeah or can you get money directly are you able to well the publisher handles all the, the transactions publisher being on, in this the, case so Microsoft, Microsoft right um, the other one big ones are like EA Activision yeah. Sony Nintendo um, the only time we really handle the, the money is when we do our merchandise, you know, that's... But luckily the whole contract is set up at the beginning, mm -hmm. so it's not like there's a bunch of surprise middlemen, so we kind of know what we're getting. And one of the reasons Troma is not with a big distributor is we have no talent. I mean, uh, <laughs> they don't want us. I mean, uh, uh, that we might get lost in the mix that we, if it's a small film like Toxic Avenger Part 2, uh, when Warner Brothers distributed on video, they paid all the attention to, I think it was, uh, was it James? Superman or James Bond or some huge movie and they just sh dumped uh, Toxic. Does, did, how do you prevent something like that if you're with a giant like Microsoft? Yeah, honestly, I think it's mostly about managing the relationship with the, the publisher and trying to say, like, hey, we're going to try to put out the best product we can for the, the money that we're giving you, or uh, we're being given. And, um, you know, try to have them basically champion your cause internally. I mean, otherwise, it's you're going to lose that battle. I mean, they, they ultimately own the platform, and if you don't have good placement on their platform, meaning when people turn on their Xbox 360, if your game isn't right there in their face, you're going to have a much harder time getting anybody to even know it exists. And I think it's going to be even more of that case, you know, with the mobile market. You know, people have their iPhone and stuff, they go to the marketplace. The, the games people buy are the ones that are on that first screen. So it's like, you got to get Microsoft to, uh, to get you some placement. What's the approximate budget? I assume you guys are considered controlled budget. You, you don't yeah. waste any money. We don't want to waste any money. So uh, what would be a budget, if you don't mind, for yeah. a typical Well, you know, it game? depends. When we made our first game, The Mall, that was uh, seven guys working for, like, what, nine months? And I think that cost us about $450,000. If you look at something like Gunstringer, um, it's substantially more because now we have about 23 employees. Um, so it's quite a bit more. But I think a lot of the, the students 
the game people, a lot of uh, people want to make a game on like the iPhone or they want to make a small Xbox indie game. I mean, you can anybody can make an iPhone game for like 400 bucks probably. They buy like a hundred dollar software package and yeah, the developer fee yeah, is like a hundred dollars. It's not very much at all. So for a very limited amount of money, if you know what you're doing, you can uh, make a, a cool fun game for like. You so know, what what's the deal with Angry Birds? What's the story <laughs> behind that? Was that like a 14 year old who figured it out or what? You know what? I don't know much about Angry Birds. I know that they had made a lot of games before. They kept making a lot of games, and they finally made Angry Birds, and that was their first hit after 30 or 40 games. Some now, did, viral things. It just took off and just snowballed did, and became did, just a huge blockbuster. I think they had like 100 million. Oh, it's like, ridiculous. So Angry Birds, did, how did, did the people who made Angry Birds make money? Because it they seems like it's free. They made a whole lot of money. How did they make the money? I, you know, I think they had a fun little product that was super cheap. I think it was only like a dollar or two. And then sometimes they give it away for free, and then they would add on. I think I want to say more stuff. So you'd have the core game, but then they'd say, "Here, here's more fun stuff." You get the core game for free, but the more fun stuff is like a dollar. So people are like, "Oh, well, a buck. Like, yeah, I'll just buy that. Why not?" And then you have a million people buy it for a buck, and uh, you're a millionaire, I guess. You can pick a film like Blair Witch Project that's kind of similar, where very low budget, relatively speaking, and then it just takes off like, yeah. virally. And uh, like Angry Birds, I think is kind of the case study now like super low investment cost but then it just sells like insane magic Troma was in large part influenced by uh, Stan Lee and the yeah. Marvel Universe. We have the Troma Universe. Did you did you pick up on that sort of the fact that we'll have Kabuki Man and Toxies? Oh, absolutely, movies? kind of that, that cross platforming you do, and uh, we kind of use that in our company. We cross platform our characters, so our characters show up in you know certain games and make cameo appearances to kind of you know you're not just pushing the character, but the Twisted Pixel brand, much like Troma has, where you know your other character will show up in your movies and that's a great way to you know market what you do Are there schools for the game to learn how to make games? Actually, yeah, there are quite a few. They're, it's getting more and more popular now. Just about every uh, major game development city has them. So like, I know there's some there, in New York, there's like, Chicago. Do you get a BA in games, or yeah. like with film now and MFA? Yeah, actually, there are. Yeah, I used to uh, teach game development in a, at a Chicago school. Where? Um, while I was at Midway at DePaul University. DePaul. Yeah. So, and so, so there's programs for uh, you know the art program has been around for quite a while. So game art, but. Uh, uh, and programming as well, but design is a pretty new field. So there's game programming degrees, and those are all uh, bachelor degrees at a lot of the major universities. Like MIT and Stanford are, are growing those programs too now too. Carnegie Mellon also has a, a really good school. Um, it's a sister school that's um, uh, just off their campus. So yeah, it's a really good one. If you were a young person today and you wanted to go into games, what do you think would be the best school, college to go to a university? Boy, you know it's. It, I think it really depends on the discipline that you want to go into. I think some schools excel at art, others more at programming. So, I mean, any of the pure, you know, co uh, programming schools like Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, and MIT, I don't think you can go wrong with those if you can get in. You know, I, mean, you know, that's, I think that's half the battle. So, if, if somebody wanted to start their own, his or her, or its own Twisted Pixel, mm -hmm. uh, MIT would be a place to go? Yeah, actually, if they went there, they'd probably be overqualified for Twisted Pixel. So. <laughs> I think we took like a year and we uh, couldn't get anyone to look at our stuff. No one liked our stuff. And there was just, it's really luck. There was one guy at a conference at Microsoft that uh, seemed to like this one game idea. Where was had. the conference? This was, uh, it's called the uh, GDC conference, the Game Developers Conference. And this is held every year in San Francisco. So all the game guys kind of get together and talk about the industry. And I'm sure there's something probably similar film. Some, or, I don't know, minds get together, who knows. Um, and we met this guy there. We, we it takes place in Rupert Murdoch's his, home, and there's basement. three other people. <laughs> one of whom is Tom Hanks. <laughs> Tom, I'm interrupting you. Uh, Go on. No, so uh, we met this guy, David Ettery, who was a great guy, and he worked for Microsoft. And we pitched him this idea we had, and he was like, uh, you know what, yeah, I, that's something I'd probably get behind. So, so uh, the lesson there, folks, for you who want to make video games, uh, go and network, go to these conferences. Uh, don't be lazy about it, and uh, don't be cheap like Uncle Lloyd here and not want to spend 10 cents on an airplane ticket. The way we structure our deals is that um, we can either decide to fund our own game and do the whole thing, get a bigger back end, or we can ask Microsoft to fund the whole thing and take all the pressure off of us, but we get a smaller back end, or we can 
decide to meet in the middle sometimes mm -hmm. and we'll kind of throw some of our money they'll put their money but uh, the great thing about that is uh, which i'm sure you know about is we retain all our own ip we don't sell our ip to anyone so the intellectual property we always try to own so we can try to make merchandise and sequels and all types of things to try to have other streams of revenue come in which seems to be going pretty well for us right now prior to the dlc which is the downloadable uh, market we really had to go to retail so that's where you had to partner with a huge you know mega corporation what is like, the dlc uh, uh, is that sorry. something in north korea uh yeah it's, uh, right. it's, it's a north zone north. where you really don't ever want to cross it's, it's bad uh so the, uh, what, what exactly is it? So DLC, I used the wrong acronym there, but downloadable content is what DLC uh -huh. stands for. Uh -huh. But really what that means is it's a channel where people can just use the internet to buy the games rather than you know get off their butt and go to the store. So it really you avoid you know, having caters to, to the whole sloth laziness stuff. side of and, America. And how do you let the, the, uh, the, the viewers, how do you let the viewers know that your movie is on the internet? How do you publicize it? Well, for an indie company, I think it's a lot of grassroots stuff. I mean, we do all, a lot of our own marketing. We rely on Microsoft for some of that, but we really still have to do a lot of it on our own. Which so that means? means going to conferences, blog posts, you know, working with magazines. Is there some couple of sentences of overriding uh, themes? That uh, well, the, the dream crusher mentality is... Uh, Everybody has ideas. It's the execution that's the, the hardest part to get it out there. But what is the dream crusher? Well, it just means like your ideas aren't really that special or unique. You just need to somehow package it in a way where people actually want to play it. So I mean, you can have an idea of a great character, but if you can't make the gameplay good around that character, mm -hmm. uh, don't bother. You know. And then you also need to find a partner to help you get, you know, the, the game out there to the masses. The thing that actually is better now, though, is you can go to the downloadable space like the Apple Store or iTunes or the Android Marketplace, and that you can do a lot more on your own. But uh, if you want to be, make big retail games, you're going to have to get in bed with a publisher. If you were going to get into games, uh, my recommendation would be find a bunch of people smarter than you are. Like, you know, I found a bunch of people smarter than I was. I tricked them and promised them you know, many wonderful things would happen to them and then trick them into moving to Texas and starting the studio. And now I'm doing pretty great. So trick people who are smarter than you. <laughs>